uh, and, and Pastor Roman White from Skyview Baptist Church. But uh, uh, I noticed something when I sit in the front row. If you listen, there's voices coming from this little, yeah, and, and I thought the church is haunted. And, uh, and then, then I, uh, the voices are saying, Mrs. White. I'm like, they've captured my wife. And then I realized you, that through the vent system, you can see my wife's down in the nursery. She's older than that. She's watching the nursery. Okay, for those who don't know my wife. And uh, uh, she's younger than me, but not that much younger. But she, she's down in the nursery, and I keep hearing Mrs. White. I'm going, you know, what's going on? So I thought what would be really funny right now if I could get away with it is I would love to go to that vent and go, Mrs. White is right. Listen to her. And, uh, and the kids would be like, we heard God. You know, and, and, uh, and so... I, uh, that actually happened back at my, uh, uh, my home church. I just took the, the church, you know, and uh, we'd merged two churches together. And, and, um, and there's a, right behind where I'm at, there's a baptistry. And the old building, so when they put that baptistry in, the pipe just shoots out the door. I mean, just out the wall. And it just goes. And, and it's great because I ask teenagers all the time, like, can you look in that pipe? I want to see if there's a problem. And I turn it on and just get them, you know. And I've had more baptisms that way than I think of in the... So, so, um, I, and, and so I'm sitting there, and behind me, I hear, and I'm thinking, it's quiet, maybe nobody will notice, you know, and I'm preaching, and I, and I just taken the church, like, you know, I became the pastor, like, two months ago, or a month ago, so I'm, I'm preaching away, and I keep hearing it, and every once in a while, I just keep hearing it, finally, I'm like, you know, you don't say anything, the crowd doesn't notice, you know what I mean? If there's someone in the back row being crazy, like those, those rebellious, troubled, no, <laughs> back here, no, but if there's someone in the back row being crazy, you don't point it out because nobody sees, you know? Finally, I just said, hey, is, does anybody else hear voices? And there's this one couple, jokesters, they're all like, just you, you know, and the rest of them heard it, so I sent one of the, uh, uh, one of the men to go check out, see what it was. It turns out, I didn't know this, I still don't know the science of it, that my son, he was a little guy back then, he found this pipe and was talking into it. Hello, is it real? And somehow that water in the baptistry works like a speaker. <laughs> and so, so we were having voices from the baptistry come out to the church. So, uh, so I'm used to voices. I hear voices all the time. And they tell me I'm not crazy, so I'm okay. And, uh, but uh, that was kind of fun to say, oh, you guys have voices too. That's really a, an independent Baptist church. That's, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not alone, yeah. <laughs> and a little, a little correction, Brother Pierce said, uh, uh, Pastor White and his wife will be up here preaching. I'm like, no. She writes it, I preach it, okay? And then, uh, and <laughs> that's, that's not true if you're online. That was a joke. And uh, I've had to really be careful online because I have, this probably surprises you, but I have an odd sense of humor. And my, my church knows this. They know if someone comes and said, Pastor White ran off with another woman, they'd be like, eh, I don't know. Like, I see, like to me, I think, I've been 30 years working on getting a good relationship. I'm not starting over. That's retarded. You know, it's like, like even if God said it was okay, I'm not interested. I like the one I got, you know. But, but if they said, well, Pastor White's in jail because he did something he thought was funny, they'd be like, okay, we'll bail him out. He, he's there. You know, that... That's, that's where I'm going to get myself in trouble. I, I, I know it, and uh, I have to be careful with my sense of humor. And now that we're online, yeah. Yeah. people in other countries don't know I'm joking. Yeah. Like I was out back, and the deacons were smoking. I said, put out them cigarettes. He's like, your deacons smoke? No, 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 not unless they're on fire. I was just making a joke. You know, I, I was, and uh, so, so I have to be, every once in a while I stop and go, I really don't beat my children. That was my sense of humor. And I look up at the camera, and and try to remember that people don't know my humor. And so, uh, and sometimes I have to be careful at other churches. I say things and they're like, does he really believe that? And so I have to stop once in a while and go, no, that was, that was my humor again. And uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And um, the problem I'm having tonight is I have two, two messages. The, like, I want to make sure you understand this message. And, and, you might, and I want to teach the other message. Uh, so you'll understand this message, but I understand that, now you don't know this, but you're trained. I don't know what the training is, but I know there is a time when you're all going to shut off. There's a shut off time. Mm -hmm. I learned this, I was, I was preaching uh, um, uh, for my, my home church, you know, Pastor Mutzler was out of town, I was a new preacher, and I was preaching, and, and I went over, but we were having a great time, so it was not a big deal, right? And then all of a sudden the whole, like, maybe about a third of the crowd, they went, and they looked like right past me, like I wasn't here. 
And I thought, oh, I lost the crowd. I don't know why I lost the crowd, because I was new at preaching. So I, I had a funny illustration. I skipped up to my funny illustration. And, and it was really funny. They went, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and they just looked past me. And I realized there's a time when the preacher's usually done. I don't know when it is, but you do. And you don't even know you do. Um, but you do. And I'll be preaching. I'll be like, and then God, hmm, we're done, aren't we? You know? And I can preach all I want at that point, but we're done. And, and so the next time that happened, I, th I was going to try something to see if I was right. And I really did this. I, I, I said, I was on point two. I said, point three. And I looked up and the whole crowd, like, it's like fish out of water. They're kind of like, you know? And, and I went, point three. Let's pray. Dear Lord, 400 people in the auditorium, nobody caught that. Nobody. Like, what was point three? Nobody asked what point three was. The worst part is my wife didn't even ask. <laughs> I was like, I was like, yeah, okay. So, so when you're done, I'm done. How's that work? So I'm going to preach the first one. I might take a little time to kind of explain it a little bit if we have some time. Um, but, but this is what helped me a little bit. Um, in the, in the Bible, you'll see God has his part, and then he gives you your part. And, um, and it is kind of funny how God does it. Uh, my, my kids, when, I was, when, I, when, they were, when they were little, I'd have a big box, right? And be, you know, leaning up against you, and you're walking it in. They say, let me help you, Dad. And they jump up and hang on the box. Yeah, right. Oh, you're such a help. Man, you're so strong. Yeah, I am, aren't I? They're kicking their feet and all that. And, and, and they help Dad. And a lot of times, God says, I need some help here. And, uh, and I'm going to do this. Now, you pray that it happens. You said you're going to do it. That's kind of like the word of God. Yeah. Like, why am I praying, you know? And uh, he said, no, I want you to be involved in this. Yeah. And by the way, I want you to tell someone about Jesus Christ. I, I want you to give them the gospel to stay and get saved. You have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's the one that draws them. Yeah. You know, I, I know you call me a co-laborer, but you don't really need me. He says, yeah, but jump on the box. We're going to work together on this. And, and, and I'm going to give you rewards in heaven. And, and, and even though you know you're hanging on the box and you're not really lifting a lot of weight, he, he wants to work with you. Yeah. And so he says, here's my part, here's your part. And when you read the Bible that way, that helps you so much. Um, you, know, I, you know, I added things to the Bible that, that aren't there. And, I just, and everybody, if I told you this, unless you've been confronted with it some way, you would just agree with me. Um, Moses and God were talking. You know the story. And, uh, and Moses uh, uh, says, God says, I'm going to kill all these people and I'm just going to start a new, new nation with you, Moses. And, uh, and, I, and I'm like, did you catch that? Moses would be like Abraham. I'm like, starting over with him. That was kind of a, a, a that was an offer too. And he said, oh no, God, don't do that. You know, he said, the, pe you, the people are going to think you brought them out here to kill them. It's going to make you look bad. It is kind of funny though. And he never said they don't deserve it. He's like, we both agree they need this. But, but and, he, and he reasoned with God, and God he says, God repented of the evil he was going to do. He changed his mind about the harm he was going to do to the people. And I said, well, you know, that was God trying to teach Moses a lesson because God already knew it before he ever talked to Moses. I mean, that's pretty obvious. God knows what he's going to do. It never said that. It said, God said, I'm going to let you talk to me, and I'll decide if I want to change my mind. He said, how can God do that? I'll give you one little fun thing, okay? Uh, this helped me a ton. Does God know everything? Yes. Yes. It, it, does everything, any knowledge that's out there exist because God made it exist? Right? It can't exist outside of God, correct? Yes. So if God knows everything, is there anything that God cannot know? No. Is Jesus Christ God? Yes. Did Jesus Christ say, I don't know when I'm coming back? That's in the Father's hand. I, I don't know. Huh. What does that mean? That means God can choose to not know. Then it mess you up. You're like, well then, you just chose not to know, yeah. So he can not know if Abraham's going to sacrifice his son or not. Because he chooses to want to find out. And when Abraham's going to sacrifice his son, he can say, now I know that you love me. Now I say, well, he already knew. That's not what God said. God said, now I know. You're going, wait a minute. But how do you do that? It's God. That kind of stuff messes you up. Who's ever had an atheist say to him, can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? Who's ever heard that? Think about that for a second. Can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? Does anybody know the answer? Yes. Yeah, he can. Well, then he's not God because he can't lift it. No, he can still lift it. 
But you, you can't do both. If you're God, you can. His ways are above your ways. He can choose to not lift it and lift it. Why? God is truth. There isn't truth, and then God measures up to it. God is the measurement of truth. So when God says 2 plus 2 is 6, that's why it says God cannot lie. God says 2 plus 2 is 6. It is 6 now. When, when Peter was supposed to walk on the water, he said, come, now you can walk on water. Is, but is it the truth? You, can, I thought if you, walked, if you got on water, you'd sink. You do. I used to sink more. I'm a little more buoyant now. <laughs> I kind of bob now, but, 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 I don't, but I don't walk on water. But God said his truth. That makes it. He is the truth. And so, so what I find then is, and, and there's things that are hard to read. You read God has these counsels of people. He says, I'm thinking about this idea. What's your idea? What's your idea? What's your idea? I kind of like yours. We'll do yours. And you're going, that, that's, why is he doing that? He, he should have just said, thou shalt go. Because God speaks in King's James, King James, just so you know. Right? <laughs> and, um, and, and it's really going to be funny if he does it with a Spanish accent. I was thinking, like, thou shalt, it's going to be real fun if he does. I don't know what it's going to be. But, um, but he, thou shalt go. He just, just says it, and it'll happen. And, but he says, nah, I'm going to give you the ability to talk to me, and I'm going to ask you what you think, and I'll decide after we're done talking. It just, that used to, in my mind, like, make God smaller. Then I realized, Wow. Like, there's just no limits. Like, I don't, it, it's, I, I want to put God in a box. Man, it's so hard for me when I get this kind of stuff. So God says, I got something for you. Yeah, I'm going to tell you to do something. I'm going to show you this in a minute. I'm preparing. <laughs> I'm going to tell you to do something, and then when I tell you to do it, um, I'm going to do my part. I'm going to tell you what your part is, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the ability to choose whether or not you're going to do your part. But I, here's what I want you to do. So James chapter 1, um, starting at verse 2. We're going to read verses 2 through 8. And, uh, and if it sounds like I can't read, it isn't that I can't read, though that wasn't that long ago I had struggled with reading. It's that I can't see very well, right? <laughs> am I, am I, this is, it's a big Bible with small print. It's got margins on the edge because people thought I make, I make notes in my phone. <laughs> so, so I'll be at maybe up going, and God. James chapter 1, verse 2, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be complete, uh, I'm sorry, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him, not, er, but, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like the wave of the, uh, of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And I didn't pray yet, did I? No. So, did I pray, Zach? You've got to help me out here. I'm looking at you for help. There we go. I just want to make sure. And, uh, and look, you prayed, and you got your prayers answered. But we'll talk about that later. That was <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer get right in the message. Heavenly Father, we do ask that you bless this, this time. What we mean by that, Lord, is we want you to send your Holy Spirit to open our, our hearts and our minds to receive your word to enfold it into our lives so we'll be defined more like your son, Jesus. Give us wisdom today, Lord. Bless us. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So God starts off by saying something's kind of odd. Brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Do you realize how ridiculous that, that, that sounds? You fall and you break your arm. You say, "Woo! broke my arm. It's so cool. Now, nowadays, actually, you'll say, oh, ow, take a picture. Yeah. Yeah. You don't believe me. My son did that. My son was, he, he fell off a little tree. I mean, just a little thing. Like, he should have never, and his arm was like, er, you know, like really, really broken. And he was going, oh, oh. And my, mom, my wife, my mom, oh, I'm in trouble now. My wife, uh, she called an ambulance. I mean, she was really worried. And, um, and, 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 and as they were coming, he goes, mom, take a picture. He said, she said, what? She said, take a picture. I want to get, I want a picture of this. I want to, and, and she goes, okay. And I was like, Sarah, do you know what you look like at a park with your son with a broken arm going? <laughs> take pictures. I'm like, everyone had to think you were the worst mom in the world, you know. And Danny's like, take a picture, take a picture. Can you see it? Can you see it? You know? <laughs> and, and so it's weird to say, Pastor, things are really tough. I'm having a hard time in my marriage. I'm having a hard time in, with finances. I, I, my health is bad. What do I do? 
Do a touchdown dance. End zone dance. Yeah. Oh. It's the Baptist church. Only Brother Pierce dances from up here. Like, uh, I saw him song leading. I'm like, he's not Baptist. He's, he's dancing while he's song leading. I want to see if he can song lead with his legs shackled together. That'd be funny to see. He'd be like, uh, I can't talk, you know, and so <laughs> I didn't say that, did I? I'm sorry. I no, I'm not. But it says, brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now he's going to tell you, he's going to explain this in a minute, but it, it, he's making an odd statement that it's hard. You're supposed to go, this is great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, how do we do this? So he says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Now, let me do the first thing. Count it all joy. The Bible says rejoy or rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoy. Joy again. Okay. Um, and, and I'm going fairly quickly because I could take too long with this. And I, I do take too long. I'm a Baptist preacher, so I got to be careful. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, but stay with me. Rejoy. So the Bible says rejoice not that the, the demons are subject unto you, but that your names are written in the book of life. Yeah. Joy is based on what is eternal. Yeah. Happiness is based on what happens. So when things are happening that are bad and you're sad, you refocus on what's eternal. Amen. What is the worst that's going to happen to you? Well, someone comes in with a gun and you go to heaven for all of eternity. Well, they, they torture me for being a Christian. Oh, yeah, then you have an extra crown for all of eternity. Yeah. Like, if you read Hebrews 11, you're going to find out that there are people they said, all you have to do is say you deny Christ, which he will forgive you for. And we won't, we won't kill you. And they're like, I'm not missing that crown. Martyr's crown. Yeah. Without faith, it is impossible to please, uh, or it is possible to please him. Uh, for, uh, for, you, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He's like, I'm not losing that reward. Most of us, if not all of us in this room, will never have the opportunity to get that eternal crown. And if somebody came in and they're like, we're going to kill you for being a Christian, that's your one chance. That's it. And we don't think like that because we don't see the reward. But they see the reward. When you see the reward, there's joy in that reward. When this trial comes in your life, it's hard, but you see a reward. Can you help me for a second, Jamin? Is that okay? Can I pick him up from, or not pick him up, because he's too big and hurt my back. But, but uh, you're going to work for me today, and I'm going to pay you $5, okay? And if you do a good job, I'll actually let you keep the $5, right? But I gotta, you know what the problem with $5 is for a kid your age? Here's the problem. Mom knows this will buy coffee. <laughs> if I give you $1, you'd keep it, but Mom's like, we're stopping at Starbucks. Is it Starbucks, Dutch Brothers? What do you guys drink around here? Is it, uh, this is Seattle. Yeah. I, oh yeah, this is Seattle. You drink tofu. That's what you drink. I know what you. It's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know what's going on up here. But but do Dutch Brothers, because because I'm learning stocks and I bought Dutch Brothers stocks, so I'm an owner. Okay. Anyways, um, so uh, so here's what we're gonna do. You're gonna work over here, but 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 over here is gonna be a paycheck. Okay. It's gonna be a five dollar paycheck, and you're gonna really actually really keep it. Are you okay with really keeping it? Is it okay if he really keeps it? And when he's filthy rich, you remember, he's picking your nursing home. So make sure he, he invests that, okay? And it's going to be a while, okay? But I'm just saying that, that you know, kids grow up fast. And, and you don't want the kind of kid that's like, hey, what, let's go for a walk to the wheelchair. You don't like that kind of stuff. So, so you're going to work. So I need you to work. I need you to hammer this. Go ahead and hammer. Wow, whoa, whoa, he's a hard worker. Look at that. <laughs> you look too much like you're dancing. No, you got to stop this here. It's, you got that from dad. It's not mom's fault, okay? It's, but, but, okay, now I need you to saw, saw, saw some stuff. And now, do you like sawing? Tell me no. Don't, don't, don't tell me yes. Don't tell me yes, okay? What, what don't you like doing? Dishes? Yes. Taking the dog out. Yes, you like taking the dog? Take the dog out. Take him out again. Take him back in the house. Take him out again. Back in the house. Take him out again. Back in the house. And every time the dog goes woof at the door, you have to run to the door. You think you own the dog. I can woof at the door all day long. He's not opening it for me. Right? Who, who obeys who? You know what I'm saying? Somebody taught me. I've never seen this before, but you may have this. It's the it's in thing. Is you put a bell at the door and the dog hits the bell. Who does that? Does anybody in here do that? Oh, you don't know about that. Well, good. I'm not alone. I didn't know you did that. We trained our dog. The dog goes to the back door. Goes ding, 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 ding. And we have to get up and run to that door. Well, you don't have to, 
but you just don't want to have to pick up what the dog leaves behind. Yeah. So, so the dog goes, ding, ding, ding. Get over here. <laughs> I open the door. Who owns who? Anyways, so, so now he's working, and, and he's doing work he doesn't like. It's hard. It's laborsome. Your muscles are sore. Big muscles, by the way. Ladies, look at this guy, huh? Big, mu <laughs> big muscles. <laughs> and, 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 and I don't know why they're laughing. That's, right. And, and so he's working. He's fatigued. He's having a hard time. Times are tough. But what's that? Every time he looks at that $5, he's like, I'm going to sauce some more because I get a job. Anybody here a contractor? Is there any a contractor? Okay, you've worked with a contractor? I, I do concrete. Okay, good. You do, oh, yeah, that's right. You do concrete. That's why. Okay, so, um, so here's what will happen. Um, I'm going to hire Zach to do concrete. He's going to do my driveway, and I want a triple driveway and all that so I can park a church bus on there because that's what Baptist preachers do. All right, so, um, so I, I get a triple driveway. He comes out. He does a great job. He shows up. I mean, he shows up and does it when he says he's going to do it, and he shows up clean and sober. That just puts you in the top 10% of all people who lay con concrete. Isn't that true? Tell me the truth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Speaks English too. That's a, that's a help. So then he comes up and gets it all, all, all set up, does a great job, and I pay him. And now, how do I reward him? I say, he's so good. What am I going to do for rewards? I'm going to give him 10 more contracts. I say, wait a minute. Concrete's hard work. It breaks his back. He, he's going to be, he's going to be 40 going, oh, there he is, just like that. <laughs> you, you look like your dad. Okay, now, so, so, he likes it. And so con concrete's hard work. What did I reward him with? I rewarded him with more because more work means more. And so when you give a contractor more work, they go, yes, now I get to hire employees because it's so fun managing employees. 40-year-old babies. <laughs> oh, no, I want to come to work today. I want to I wanna go play. Can I go play? Oh, okay. Are you going to pay me for it? No. Well, I'm going to call my senator. <laughs> I want to I wanna do nothing and get paid all day. You got to get voted in for that. So, um, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? Pastor, that's what I'm saying. Anyways, uh, no, I'm kidding. And so <laughs> you thought I was going somewhere else, didn't you? Yeah. Um, so anyway, so here he is. And, and every time it gets tough on him, when he looks to the reward, he gets joy. Man, I don't know about you. I, I don't know why people don't do this. I love overtime. Time and a half? I worked one time. I got double time and a half. And I was like, yeah, I'll volunteer. I don't want to do that. Uncle Sam takes it all out in taxes. I don't know. My check looks bigger. Yeah. I'm like, I, I, I worked my 40, and if I'd say just a little longer, cha-ching, yeah. give me those hours. Give me the double time and a half. I'm more than happy to work that. And, and you say, well, what's the deal? Because I see the mm -hmm. count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. You with me so far? Mm -hmm. It's hard. It's laborsome. But you see the reward. You want to go get your reward? Let's go get it. Wait, wait. I got one word for you. Ready? Tithe. Okay, now you can have it. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it to the pastor. <laughs> you ever seen a pastor's handshake? <laughs> okay, so uh, <laughs> I didn't say that. Um, so count it all joy. The idea is joy is when you focus on the eternal. Now stay with me. That's your part. God's part is to give you the trial or allow the trial in your life, okay? There's no trial that comes in that God doesn't allow. It doesn't mean the world is without sin. It doesn't mean it was God's will. It is not God's will for someone to get drunk and then get behind the wheel and hit your car. That is not God's will. I can tell you in the Bible, it says, be not drunk with wine or is excess. But I can tell you that, it, that, that God uses all things for good, that, that God is using the trial, Okay? So you look at the reward and you say, I just contracted 10 jobs. Now, you talk to a contractor. I used to do sales and I learned this. If you ever do sales and you're talking to an owner of a company, here's a line to get them talking, when, even when they won't talk much. When they get to the point where they say, well, how do I know I can trust you and stuff like that? I say, you ever have any employee problems? Mm -hmm. You might as well just go get a cup of coffee, a dozen donuts and wait because they're going to start telling you stories. 
Oh, I put up security cameras and, and they stole the security cameras and I did this and this guy showed up drunk every time he showed up he was drunk and I wrecked my vehicle. I mean, they're still telling you all these things. I mean, wait a minute, what? having employees is the blessings of God. But there's a whole lot of trials to it. It's tough. It's hard. So why are you doing it? Cha-ching. When you build your million dollar home and pay for it in cash, cha -ching. sorry, we're in Seattle. When you build your million dollar garage <laughs> and, and pay for it in cash, you know, <laughs> prices have gone up a little bit around here. And, uh, but the idea is, is uh, joy is based on the eternal. So it says this, focus, choose to focus on the eternal when temptation comes. That's your choice, okay? It says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Patience is um, uh, long enduring, okay? I'll tell you the people, and by the way, I'll tell you the strength of this church. The strength of this church is people stay so long. Um, you can bring someone in and they have a one-year flash and, and, oh man, I, I can do all these things. I'm super Christian and I, and I do all the services and I, and, I, and I do all the soul winning and I, I da, 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 I'm, I'm super Christian, but, but then they disappear. Christianity is measured in decades. Yeah. And when you, that long, that patience. God said this, I'm giving you a trial, okay, yeah, but I'm not letting it go away. I want you to learn patience. I want you to stick with the trial. See, patience is sticking with the trial. The actual word actually means burying under. It means I'm, I have this trial and I'm carrying it. God, I can't make another step. Okay, I guess one more. I used to uh, wrestle in high school, and, um, and I, I was really pushing myself. In my senior year, I stopped all of the sports and just did wrestling, and, and, uh, and so I wanted to see how far I could go. And believe it or not, I was second in the state of Oregon, and she was tough for a six-year-old. But, um, but, no, but I was second in the state of Oregon, and, and, and I was pushing myself to see how far I could push. I got up early. I did all the, all the stuff you see on Rocky. You know, I was trying to do everything I could do. And uh, I remember that I ran one time, and I just kept, I was running, and my legs gave out from underneath me. I'd gone so far, I'd done so much, that my legs just gave out. Never had that happen. You know what I learned, though? What? I'm laying there on the ground. Like, <gasps> <sighs> then I got up, and I went, you can still run. Yep. I didn't know you could do that. I thought your legs gave out, and they called the doctor, and you got to see if you lived. I had no idea, until my legs gave out. And God says, patiently, patience is that enduring. Yep. I can't make it any farther. No, you can't. Wait a minute. What, what did God say? There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be attempted above that you're able, but will with the uh, temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, this is where it gets hurtful. That means you can bear the things in your marriage, and you can stay married. That means you can bear the things in, in, in your, the relationships that God has put you in. Children, you can bear your parents. When you become teenagers, okay, um, young people, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Look up here for just a second, ready? I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You're going to become a teenager. Well, <laughs> as long as you behave yourself, your parents might send you to heaven. No, okay. <laughs> but you're going to become a teenager, right? And you're going to think your parents changed. That all of a sudden they started just freaking out for nothing. Do you know why you're going to think that? Because they do. One day you look at this kid who was a little kid, who's all of a sudden a little kid in an adult body, and you're going to do the math. Can I show you the math that gets you in trouble? How old are you? Eleven. Uh, let me do some quick math here. Uh, nine. That's nine times twelve. Ninety. One hundred and eight. Is that right? One hundred and eight. One hundred and one hundred and eight months. You could be married. Exactly. Mom and dad, <laughs> they're going to start early, right? So, so you look at this kid and you'll be like, they're 15, 36 months from now. Now, I'm not telling everybody to get married at 18, but 36 months from now, you could be legally married. 36 months and nine months later, you could be a parent. And you still don't know how to even eat your cereal out of a bowl like a human being. 
I mean, you can't even eat cereal and you're going to try to raise kids. And your parents go, oh my goodness, I am so far behind. My kids are barely above animal stage. What am I going to do with these kids? And so they do freak out on you. You're not imagining it. They just start going, how come you never clean your room? You're like, I have never cleaned my room in my life, no matter what you said. And all of a sudden, now you're having a coronary heart attack. Like, what's wrong with you? Because they look at you and realize, in 36 months, you're going to raise my grandkids and you can't even pick up your underclothing. Like, what am I supposed to do? I am a failure, and I'm going to be trying to figure, I'm going to be raising my grandkids. Yeah. Well, that was such a bad idea. And so, and so you're, you're laughing now. All right. But, so so what, what, what happens is then, as your parents change, and they do change, and as your parents are changing, they make some of their decisions will be bad decisions. They won't be the best decisions. You'll get older and you will both agree, yeah, I probably shouldn't have done that, right? And, and as you are the child, and they have authority over you, and they're still trying to figure out how to get their own life together, and they're, and they're told by God in the process to make sure your life is together, and they're doing the best they know how, and they're making mistakes, you get mad. My parents say, nobody finds contradictions like teenagers. My parents say this, and then they do that. My parents say this, and then they do that. And, 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 and one day I, I want to go, hey, parents, why don't you, why don't you take a second? What? My kids say they love Jesus, and they don't give me any grace. They crucify me because I am a mess. I am 52 as of January 27th. I'm a pastor of a church, and I'm going to my 30th year of marriage. And at best, I'm a mess. And I thought when I got here, when I looked as a teenager and I saw people like me who were, you know, read the Bible this long and served God this long and knew some things, that I'd be kind of okay and you're just kind of maintaining. And I, I'm honestly, I've never had a birthday affect me. 30 didn't affect me. 40 didn't affect me. 50 got me for one reason. I'm like, God, am I ever going to get this? I'm like, it's like I haven't even touched the Bible yet. I'm like, what am I supposed to do? So kids, your parents are a mess, trying to keep you from being a mess, and you get angry. When God said, patiently endure. I'm teaching them while I'm teaching you. I'm going to watch you under this trial of your parents trying to figure it out, and you're going to have to carry this burden, and I'm going to have you encountered all joy. You get rewards in heaven. I'll tell you a little secret, and hopefully nobody said this because I'm going to get in trouble for this. I do, this will get me in trouble. I'll tell you a little secret. Ready for a little secret? When someone comes up and says, man, she's such a good wife, that's code for he's such a bum. <laughs> because if you have the perfect husband, you don't have to be the good wife. It's just natural. If you did everything right, nobody's, nobody's impressed that you, that you did everything right back. It's... You're kind of rotten if you don't. It's when he does things wrong and you act like a Christian and you love him back that people go, wow, what a good wife. But better than that is when God says, wow, what a good wife. Cha-ching. There's rewards. You married someone to give them a wife, not to get a husband. You can't make someone be your husband but you can make you be their wife. You married someone to give them a husband, not to get a wife. She may not always give you a wife. There will be times in relationships where one or the other is not strong and the other has to lift them. And if you married them to give them a husband when they're weak is when you get to give them a husband because that's when they need one. So they don't need you if they don't have trouble or trials or hard times that they have to get through. And, and the thing is, people go, well, I, I knew that, but I didn't know it would happen this long. You got three weeks to get your life together. Or I want to stop being a husband or a wife to you. And God says, huh, here's why you count it joy. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but 
let patients have her perfect work. So you have to look for the joy. The second thing is you have to actually let patients have its perfect work. Do you know that I can be under trials and I can run away? I don't have to let the trials do the work in my life that God wants them to do. So here's one of the odd things in the Christian life. And I have to be careful because I, I get very extreme. So it sounds like I'm saying, go get a whip and whip yourself and that'll make God so happy. Okay, I, I'm not talking about you jumping into a trial because you want pain. So you, It's not that. But when God allows a trial into your life, you lean into it and say, what do you want this to do in my life, God? What is this for? You don't go, trial! You know what's so funny? You know how silly we are? Ready? Oh, God, please use me. Well, the Bible says love your enemies. I'm going to use you. Go love your enemy. Oh, God, I have an enemy. Strike them with lightning and kill them. <laughs> Take my enemies away. Well, I thought you asked me to use you. You can't love your enemy unless you have a tough. That's tough to do. So if you ask God to use you, he's going to give you an enemy. You say, but God, I thought it would be someone from another country. I didn't know it would be someone in my own house. See, it's a lot easier when you get to go home. But when you go home and somebody's broken and they've become your enemy, then God says, yeah, you asked me to use you. This is the answer to your prayer. But it hurts. I think that's what he wrote in the Bible. It hurts. If it didn't hurt, if, if it wasn't hard to do the labor, you, you wouldn't get a reward. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Oh, so you're saying, God, that you gave me a trial, you gave me a driveway to do, and I really did a good job. I, I did a knock up, knock up, bang out, no, knock out, bang up job. There we go. <laughs> knock out, verbally dyslexic. A, a knock out, bang up job. The driveway was, is, is, had the right slant on it. You didn't cut corners. You did everything right. You, you rebar because I had to put a bus on there. You did everything you should have done and you did it on time. You showed up, dude. Like you answered your call. Contractors don't answer the phone. Yeah. And you answered your phone. I'm like, wow. So I go, I'm going to give you a reward. What? Ten times the trials that you had before. Well, I, I don't want that reward. Well, you're a contractor. What do you want? How do contractors become millionaires? By taking on trials. How do Christians become heavenly millionaires? By taking on the work, the trials. That, that's, that's, that's work. That's labor. We understand that, except for we, sometimes we lose our joy because we don't see the eternal. So you have to let patience have its perfect work in your life. You have to give God permission to use the trial to change you. Because God won't force it. He says, I'm telling you to let it change you. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to young people and they said, I'm struggling at home. And I said, let that struggle change you. Because otherwise, I guarantee you this, and it, does, it won't make sense to you when you're young, but I guarantee you when you're older, you'll know what I mean. If you don't let God use that trial to change you, you will carry that trial to your children. Yep. Um, this is a fun thing. I won't make you raise your hands. Go ahead and say, ladies, which, how many of you, in, don't raise your hands. How many of you said, I'm not going to be like my mother? Right? Okay. Now, wait a second. If I went to your mother and asked her, are you like your mother? You know what she'd say? I'm not going to be like my mother. So guess what you just became by saying, I'm not going to be like my mother? Your mother. You know who I swore I would never be? That guy who yells when nobody cares. How many times have I said, shut the door? You're letting all the heat out. Has it ever dawned on you that 400 times later, it hasn't helped and you're still doing it? I was never going to be that guy until I became that guy. How many times have I said, I know I'm the guy now, but it just feels so much better to yell about it. Because <laughs> maybe one day they'll hear it, you know. But I'd still do it. And, and you, know, you know the other guy I am? Mr. Lazy. I swore I'd never be that guy. Here it is. Ready? 
There it goes. I got my water over there and I'm thirsty. Danny! Yeah. <laughs> Danny! <laughs> now, that used to happen at my house, but I'm not like that anymore. <laughs> Danny! Where are you? What are you doing in your room? Get in here! You didn't ask me for permission to come in your room. While you're here, can, can you give me that water? <laughs> I swore I'd never be that guy. And guess what? Don't talk to Danny, please. <laughs> so, teenagers, ready? Let God do a work in your heart and change you so you can carry the burden because he's preparing you for more ministry. He's preparing you for more ministry. Um, and it says, if any lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Now, you ready for this? And I'm over time, aren't I? i got to go quick now. I got, yes, you guys are going to shut off. I, huh? do I got, how much more time do I have before they shut off? Tell me the truth. Don't say, just keep preaching, preacher. Five to ten minutes? Okay, good. Okay, ten minutes. Uh, I think I can do this in ten minutes. If you can do this, can you get right with God quickly? Amen. Okay, good. Then we'll just do this. And, and if we get done early, maybe we'll all go to Sherry's and beat the other church because they, they didn't get right with God as quick as you. So, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Now, he's telling you this. I'm going to give you this trial, and I want you to have joy in the trial. Not happiness. You're not happy with trials. Trials are horrible. You're unhappy. Okay, it's okay to be unhappy and have joy. You with me so far? So I want you to have joy in the trial. And, um, and, then, and then I want you to let the trial do the work in your life that I intend for it to do. Be seeking, God, why do you want me to have this? What are you doing with this? Thank you, God, for this. Thank you doesn't mean I like it. Thank you means I trust the reward. Thank you means uh, thank you for giving me this job of putting the cement uh, driveway in. It doesn't mean you like it. It doesn't mean it's not hard. It doesn't mean you're not away from your family. It just means you, you believe there's a reward that's worth it. And so, I, so then you get to the third part. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who give it to all men liberally and abradeth not. Okay? So here's what he said. Now, if you don't understand why, ask me. Yeah. Here's the worst part. Okay? I just wasted my time. Why? Because I just gave you a wonderful explanation of what this means, right? But God says, that's not how you're going to learn it. How? You're going to ask me to show you. And I'll show you. Yep. Ask me to teach you to think like I think. Because it's so different than how we think. Yeah. I'll give you one I still struggle with. I struggle with, I struggle with. I, I, I first struggled with the martyr's crown. I tried to, literally, because I, every show I ever watched, you know, it, people say, what do you watch on TV? I don't watch a lot of TV. It's not because I'm so spiritual. It's actually because I'm so unspiritual. There are shows you can watch. I don't want to watch them. I want to see someone get shot. I want to see the bad guys. You know, I want to see someone jump off a building and shoot 20 people and take them out with a Bowie knife. And, and so I, I, I can't watch a whole lot. I, one of the jokes I had is so my wife and I are watching. We have um, Clear Play and, and Vid Angel, if you know what that is. It takes all the bad stuff out or a lot of the bad stuff. And so we were looking for a series maybe that we could watch together. And, and we found this pirate film. And, and, and it starts off, it shows this guy that's hanging from a noose and he's choking to death. The other guy's going, where's, where's Blackbeard hiding? Where's he hiding? And, and the guy wouldn't talk, and he takes a big knife, and he just stabs him in the back. And the guy's just convulsing. And then he says, you better, you should have told me, you blank. And as soon as he said, you blank, I shut it off. Because I'm a Christian, okay? I thought, it's okay to stab the guy, torture the guy, let him convulse. But if you're going to cuss when you do it, I won't watch you. I'm such a hypocrite, man. I can't believe it's like, it's like I had no problem with the graphic convulsing in blood. They did a good job of that, you know. But if you're going to cuss when you do it, mm -mm, we don't do that. And I thought, man, I'm a hypocrite. I, I can't believe that. And so often we don't see things the way God sees them. Here's one here's I can't, I can't, well, I tried to fathom, and I'm getting to a place where I can do this, is picture myself being martyred for Christ. Every time I tried to picture it, they would take the sword to chop my head off, and I'd duck down, and I'd kick them, and I'd bite their ankles, and I, I couldn't, in my mind, see it in my mind. What, what, you know, what would I say for Christ? How would I, how would I be? Because there's a reward you're never going to get if you're not martyred. If I, if I have my way, I'm going to pick it. 
I'm gonna, when it's time for me to go to a nursing home, I'm going to have them ship me to the Middle East, put a sign on me, say, Jesus is the only way to heaven, I'll send you to hell, something like that. And I'm going to have them push, my, push my, my hospital bed in the middle of the square, and I'll start preaching. <laughs> I'm like, I want to go out with style, all right? I'm, I'm going to get a crown when I get to heaven, but if I can do it my way, I'm going to pick the last couple, you know, I, I only got an hour to live, quick, chop my head off, you know, I, I, but that doesn't work that way, okay? <laughs> I'm just saying that, that, that there's a crown you're not going to get. And, and I believe in eternal rewards. And nobody who gets the martyr's crown actually says you will be right there with Jesus Christ. Nobody who gets the martyr's crown says, oh, I wish I didn't get that. Nobody. So I, I worked on that, starting to think like God thinks. I still can't, and I'm ashamed of this. I wish I could. Someone comes into the church, and they say, we're going to shoot you. I'm like, I'm at the stage now. I honestly believe I'd be like, shoot me. But please, here, not here. I want to survive. I got a, like a bulletproof fat right here that'll just, it, you have to have a big bullet to get through all this. I want to, I want to go, okay? Don't, don't leave me laying here. And, and I'm, I'm really kind of like, okay, because I get a reward in heaven, right? My kids? If my, my kids say I'm going to go to a country and I'll probably be martyred. There was a, a Syrian man who uh, smuggled Bibles into uh, Islamic countries and it's death. They find you. 50% of the smugglers who smuggle them in um, die a martyr's death. They have training on how to stand for Christ and be a witness for Christ when you, when you die. They will usually call and ask for money. Um, um, and and he's, a, he's, a, he's an independent Baptist guy. I mean, he's a good guy. And, and, and you don't have, I mean, they'll ask for $20 million or something. You, you don't have it. And, and he's had to hear them be martyred. 50%. They're, they're, going to get a reward, they're going to get a wonderful reward in heaven. But what would I do? What would my kids give in time? And call to God to carry those Bibles. I don't see it like God sees it. I wish I did, but I don't, because I lack wisdom. I don't reason like God reasons. I don't see it like God sees it. I know in my head that that should be an honor, and I, and I, I should be thought, hey, do that. That's great. I'm like, hey, no, no, no. I've lived up my life. Give me the Bibles. I'll smuggle them in. I look a lot more Arabic than you do. <laughs> you put a beard on me, and I... I look at and uh, but no I should say yeah that's that's wise you got incredible rewards so if I lack wisdom if I can't see how that God says it God says just ask me I'll help you to see it like I see it so I guess it's almost futile I, I showed you how God sees it but but there comes a point where, where God makes it personal and you go God, can you give me 10 more jobs? If you gave me one, did I do good enough with this one? Would you give me 10 more? Okay, I'll give you 10 more. Man, that hurt. Man, I hate this. I like the reward. God, can I get some overtime? I don't like overtime. I want to go home. But man, I like time and a half. God doesn't take out taxes. <laughs> it's tax-free. Taxes aren't in heaven. I don't believe in purgatory, so you can just figure it out from there. And uh, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And here's the last part. He says, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Do you believe God more than you believe anything else? I'll give you one illustration. I may have given it here before, but this really helped me to understand how that works. And uh, if you haven't heard it before, act amazed. Like it changed your life. Like it did for me, okay? <laughs> I was the pastor never heard that before. That was great. Turn to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. And then we're done. You, you kids doing okay? Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. You're doing better than the old people. The old people are asleep. It's just us right now here. They, they don't even know I'm talking about them, just so you know. All right, so uh, Matthew chapter 14. And uh, old people, by the way, is anybody over 20, right, kids? Yeah, yeah anybody over 20? You need, yeah, we need to give you a walker. All right. Um, uh, let him ask in faith, nothing, nothing wavering. Now, Matthew 14, verses 28 through 31, says this. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, 
bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. Then Peter was come down out of the ship. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Now, this is the illustration, Peter getting out of the boat and walking on the water. You've all heard the illustration, okay? And, uh, and then he walked on the water, and then, then he saw the waves, and he, and he sunk, and Jesus grabbed him. Now, Jesus tells you at this point why he's telling you the illustration. He says, O ye of little faith. Yeah, you guys are awesome. Try that with me all together. Right? O ye of little faith. So this is about faith. This is a lesson to learn about faith. That's what Jesus said here. This was about faith. This wasn't about whether, what the buoyancy of water is or anything like that. This is about faith. So what does he want us to learn about faith? So here's Peter in a boat going along, trying to survive. Um, I, I, I didn't really understand that. I, I wanted to go out. I'd never, I'd never been actually out in the ocean. I had been in, uh, in the bay before, but I hadn't been in the ocean. I had a, a friend of mine. He has a 21-foot uh, aluminum Duckworth boat, nice boat. And he was going to take me out in the ocean. And so we actually got out in the ocean, and they're 12-foot waves. And I didn't even know what that meant. I never really, but he, was, he, he went there all the time, so he knew what he was doing. But I can't tell you what it felt. Once we got away from land, and you go up on this wave, and then you go down. And you saw nothing but water. Yeah. And then I'm like, how does a Coast Guard find me and all of this when my little head is sticking out of the water? Like, how's the helicopter going to find me? By the way, they don't know where we are. And we don't have a radio. I don't know how well my cell phone works underwater. <laughs> they say it works, and if it doesn't, I don't know if you get your money back when you're dead. I don't know how that works. So, so I started getting a little nervous. And then he wanted to show off. And he got up on top of a 12-foot wave, and he rode the waves like a surfboard. I didn't know boats could do that. It was the first time I've ever done that. Who's ever done that in a boat? Okay, so what happens? Imagine being on the, 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 the roof of this building, and three-fourths of your boat is hanging out into nothing. Well, one-fourth of your boat is... Bark, and he says, go look over the end. I look over the end. I'm 12 feet in the air with nothing underneath me, out in the middle of nowhere, and nobody knows where we are. And I'm looking at my friend realizing, he's not the smartest friend that I have. Like, he, he doesn't understand he should be scared. If that motor's done, we can't row in. And I think, I think he would look, me, look at me and say, he's my flotation device. I mean, he, he's, and I was like, oh. And there's another fellow with us, his, his name was Nick, and Nick was a Russian guy, and Nick goes, Mark, Mark, let's go back to shore. This is crazy. Let's go back. He said, well, we're fine, we're fine. I'm like, Mark, let's go back. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to seem wimpy, and Nick was doing enough. To, so I'm like, finally, Mark, what? Nick is scared. Bring the boat back. Come on, man. For Nick, you know? And, and I was like, when you get out in that water, you realize even those big ships are really not a big deal. The ocean can swallow them up. And uh, so, so if you're a fisherman, you know people who've died. You know that the water is dangerous. You know you can only do so much, and there comes a point where it's out of your control. So now, here's Peter and all the other fishermen trying to row to shore. There's a storm and they're trying to stay alive and they're trying to turn into the waves and they're trying to bail the ship and they're trying to do all the things they know how to do. So people are yelling out commands and telling them, everybody's working as a team to try to stay alive. So it's important you, you picture that. Then here comes Jesus walking across the water and maybe they, when they say it's a ghost, I'm kind of wondering because every culture has their grim reaper kind of story. Maybe they're thinking it's the grim reaper. You know, uh, if you're Spanish, La Jarona. I mean, there's the, everyone has their, their stories. And either way, they're like, I never really want to see a ghost, but this is the last time I want to see a ghost. Uh, he's coming to take one of us, whatever it is. And Jesus yells out, uh, uh, don't fear, it's me, right? And then Peter says, and that's where we come to the story, he says, Lord, if it be you, bid me to come to you on the water, because Jesus is walking on the water. Now, can water kill you? Okay. Can you walk on water? Who here has ever walked on water? Okay. So is it true that you can't walk on water? So Jesus said, come, that changed the truth. Now you can walk on water. Because God's word, faith is believing what God said. Okay? More than you believe anything else. So now you can walk on water because Jesus just said, come. So he got out. He started walking on the water. 
as he's walking on the water, the Bible very clearly says he notices the boisterous winds, the winds and the waves that kill people. Do winds and waves really kill people? Is that the truth? Okay. He sees that truth and he sinks. And Jesus grabs him, picks him up, and says, oh, you little faith. Okay, so, so here's the question for you, because you've got to believe God more than anything else, right? Which one is true? Jesus, uh, the, the, the Jesus, you can walk on water when Jesus says you can walk on water, or winds and waves can kill you. Which one is true? Perfect answer. Both of them. Satan's lie was actually the truth. Faith is when you believe what God said more than any other truth. That's what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. It's more real than any other reality. The evidence points to the fact that it's more true than any other truth. We often think of Satan's lie as being a direct lie. Uh, no. People die in the water. That's true. But believing what God said more than you believe anything else is faith. When God said it, that made it true. So, so is, is believing what God said more than, so let me say it this way, believing God's reality more than any other reality is faith. That's why it's called the substance of things hoped for. It's more real than the ground I'm standing on. It's more substantial than the pulpit I'm holding. It is, it, it is the highest truth. That's what faith is, believing God, what God said more than any other truth. Do you understand? And I, I'm taking a little second here, but this will help you. Do you understand the lie that most of you believe? I'll give you a lie. The Bible says, holding the shield of faith, meaning I believe what God said over what Satan says, um, more than, uh, than, than and, or having the, above all things, um, uh, have the shield of faith that you may quench the fiery darts of the devil. What are fiery darts? So if an arrow hits me, I can survive. It's actually pretty hard to hit a fatal shot. And if I can get treated, I could be in battle and be hit by an arrow in a lot of places and still survive. You have to hit an artery or heart or head or something like that. Well, I don't have any vital organs up here, but other people do. And uh, so, so when an arrow hits you, but when a fiery arrow hits you, the fire goes across your whole body. And, and the Bible says Satan's the father of lies. Okay? So he gives you a lie that you believe. And that lie permeates across your entire body. And you'd be surprised how many lies you believe. So um, I'll give you something I learned at the conference down in San Diego that really helped me. So um, uh, number one complaint of men when they're in counseling is this. I can't make my wife happy. I can't convince my wife I love her. That's the number one complaint. And, and it seems crazy, but ladies, you've you got to admit, sometimes you know, your husband will come to you and he'll say, he'll say uh, you'll, you'll look at him and say, look, you don't do it that way. Well, how do I do it? You do this, 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 and this. I mean, he's, pff, note one, note two, okay, point three, point four, okay, I got it all down. Then he comes back to the situation, he's like, oh, she told me what to do. Here goes. This, 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 and this. No, that doesn't work here. This is different. Duh. You know, <laughs> what do I do? And, and uh, the preacher preached, a preacher preached down the conference, great message, and I loved how he approached it. And we all knew we were getting set up. It was pretty obvious when he said it because he was a good man. And you wouldn't make these statements without having something to say. He said, uh, I'll tell you this, I'll tell you the story because it's kind of fun. We got a minute. He said, um, uh, he said, I got these young men who are looking for a submissive wife. He said, I call them part of the eunuch ministry. They'll never get married. He <laughs> says, there's no such thing as a submissive woman. And he's going on. Well, you make a statement like that. And it was, a, it was all men's meeting. But you know at that point you're getting set up. If you're a guy, you know, here we go. I'm going to get my beating. You know, and, you, and if you're dumb enough to say amen, <laughs> you've never been in one of our meetings before, apparently. And so, so he's like, no such thing as a submissive wife. And he's going on and on. He says, these guys are waiting for a submissive wife, and they're never going to find one. I tell them, you're, gonna, you, you're part of the eunuch ministry. There's no such thing as a submissive wife. And they said this, from Genesis chapter 3 on, Nobody's naturally submissive. That's an act of God. That's someone, that's someone running to God. If you're waiting for someone who has a submissive nature, you have to get pre-Genesis chapter 3. Oh, that was pretty good. And he said this. He said, God said, husbands, love your wife like Christ loved the church. And he started explaining what that looks like and, and some of the dumb things we do as men. And, 
And we took our beatings, and, it, and we were happy to. We paid money for that. I, I want to be a better husband, and, and it's good when a, when a man who knows what he's talking about uses the Bible and, and does the surgery you need. So, so that was all good. Then he made a statement at the end that just broke my heart because it really wasn't true, and I'll show you what I mean by that because I don't, I don't want to criticize him. If you, let me qualify this. Not, if, I, if I walked away here, it'd be mean. But um, he, said, if, uh, he said, if a man will love his wife like Christ loved the church, she will follow him anywhere. She'll do anything for him. And I immediately thought, oh. but Christ loves the church, and we don't do anything for him. We don't really believe he loves us. We believe he loves the whole world, but we won't accept his love. Deep down inside, most of the people in here believe because you have a besetting sin, because you haven't got something straight in your life yet, because you, you aren't everything you're supposed to be, that God is very unhappy with you and he just doesn't actually really love you. But you kind of pat yourself on the back. I won't let God love me because I don't deserve it. And I thought, I, think, I actually want to talk to the preacher because I'm like, well, how do you find the balance? Because, because you know, my wife has to accept that love and, and the church doesn't accept Christ's love. So there's this husband who's trying his best. I said I love you. I did this because I love you. I said, no, you don't love me. No, you don't love me. And that's the weapon that women have that men can't do anything with. I'm like, honey, we, we weren't supposed, this wasn't in the budget. You don't love me. It is now. <laughs> okay, can't argue with that. Whatever you want. And, um, and so I really pondered about it. And, and, and I was like, Lord, what is that balance? What am I supposed to do? And, and how does this, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. The principle in Genesis chapter two, everything produces after its kind. Right? So if you're a youth director and you want good teens, become what you want. Make a list of what you want them to be and become that. If you're a parent and you want good kids, become what you need to, to be and, uh, and then or what you want, write down what you want them to be and become that. I'm going to help you with one real quick thing. Kids, plug your ears. Plug your ears. I don't want you to know this, okay? You're, you're frustrated your kid won't clean his room? Yeah. I'm going to go to your house and walk into your room right now. <laughs> Unfortunately, they became what you are, not what you wanted. Yeah. Okay, unplug your ears. How did you know I said that? You could hear me, couldn't you? <laughs> He's not. Good. Ears off. There we go. All right. So, um, so understand this then. Um, I was thinking about this and I said, I think I know what the problem is. Here's what it is. Most men, uh, if you go to the average, and I'm, I'm not pessimistic, but this really is true. Very few marriages conference talk about oneness and spirituality, about how God brought you together to serve him. Every marriage conference talks about how to have peace and happiness. The ultimate in Christian marriage is peace and happiness. It has nothing to do with winning a world of Christ or suffering for Christ. Or ser it's just how to have peace. Yep. Well, most of the problem in the home for peace is the man. It really is true. I'm not, I'm not making that up or just trying to be... Uh, women are really more uh, tuned into relationships and men are kind of tuned out. And so you kind of have to hit them upside the head to kind of like the TV that doesn't work. You know? Guys, you know, get, get tuned in make this important, you know, that kind of stuff. So that's what a lot of marriage conferences are, just how to have peace. You with me so far? And so I say, well, how, how do I make my wife understand that I love her? And then, I, and then it hit me. You produce what you are, not what you want. I know God loves me. Kind of. Recently, he's kind of tied my hands and didn't let me do as much work as I do. I, I'm a works person. I kind of express my love and doing things for you. And, um, and I know it's God. I knew, I knew he tied my hands. He, he, he made me slow down. And I really, really don't like that. I really don't like that. But why don't I like that? I, I know I'm in God's will. Well, it's because it's really hard for, imagine, for me to imagine God's pleased with me and he adores me and he loves me even if I give him nothing. I don't really feel that way. I talk to God about it privately. I say, God, I know you love me. I know you do. But I don't know that you do. I believe your word. I choose to accept your word. But I really feel in the bottom of my heart that I've got to do something to be special to you. To what do I have to give you? I've got to give you something to be special. I can't imagine that I'm so special that if I did nothing, he's a, he adores me. So the, the reason my wife struggles receiving my love is because I'm producing what I am. I, I don't know how to let God love me 
and just accept it. And then I look at my wife and go, what's wrong with you? I would die for you. Well, sounds like what God would do for me. I, I would give you everything. I'll provide for you. Well, sounds pretty familiar to anybody. Uh, who does perfect at that? Jesus Christ. Yet if I were to ask you, do you really honestly feel in the bottom of your heart that Jesus accepts you and loves you like you are? And you are honest. You go, I really need to do better. Now, let me ask you the truth. Is it true that you really need to do better? Is it true that your service for God is lousy at best? Is it true that you deserve to, to have God just throw you away? But did God say he loves you? So much that he gave his son to die for you? Did Psalms say that he adores you? So here's the question. Which one do you choose to believe most? Well, I kind of pat myself on the back because I don't let God love me because I don't deserve it. Yeah, I think he said you don't deserve it. He doesn't love you because you deserve it. He just chooses to love you. Which one do you choose to believe most? I should be done, but this will help you super. So I'm just going to give you two more verses. Are you okay with that? Amen. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verses uh, 38 39. Not in my notes, so this may go bad. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, verses 38 and 39. You ready? It's going to talk about faith. And it says this, Now the just shall live by faith. That's an Old Testament quote. You, you, it's quoted from the Old Testament. It's quoted in the New Testament about seven times. It's the definition of what, how we, we look at faith, okay? The just shall live by faith. Um, uh, verse 38. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So we're talking about faith. And we're talking about drawing back from faith. So here's what you learn first off. Well, let me read the next verse. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them who believe to the saving of the soul. Could you help me one more time? I want to have you help one more time. This time I'm going to call you faith, okay? okay I'm not going to pay you this time. Is that all right? All okay, right, good. So here, stand right here. This is what faith is, okay? So this is the definition of faith. You ready? Um, now, it says, when faith comes to me, when God presents the truth to me, okay? If faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of, word of God. So God presents the truth to you. When you have a choice, it says right here, very clearly, you have a choice to draw back and not accept it or to believe it. It's actually talking about saving faith. Here it says, draw back unto perdition. That means damnation or destruction. And it says, but we're not of them who draw back we are of them that believed unto salvation. You with me so far? Yes. So here's what God said. You have a choice. Faith isn't something that was, uh, one time someone said, said, God gives you a measure of faith, right? And that's, so you only have so much faith you can use. That's not what it means. Faith is believing what God revealed to you. If you read Hebrews 11, it says, Abel believed God to sacrifice a, a lamb instead of fruit. And that was reckoned unto him for righteousness. He never prayed the sinner's prayer. He, re, he believed what God had revealed to him. Romans chapter 1. So, a creation can, can, can show you enough about God that you can be saved. So you're without excuse. God has revealed himself to you through creation. Enough for salvation. The only factor that, that you need. So a measure of faith is how much uh, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the... So how much has God revealed himself? If you live in America, you can get... I have two Bibles on my phone. I push a button and my phone reads it to me. Kings used to do that in the Old Testament. I mean, you have so much that's been given to you. If you live in Syria, you can't have a Bible. And so, I think Syria. I'm not, if you live in, in some countries, you can't have a Bible. They have a less measure of, of how much God has revealed to them. And you have a larger measure of faith. You with me so far? You understand how that's it's measured out to you by how much you, how many opportunities you have to believe what God has showed you. So now God shows me something. The Bible says this: I can choose to not believe it. I can choose to look at the winds and the waves and say that's my greatest truth. Or I can choose to believe what God said above all other things. Jesus said, "Come." When I said, "Walk on the water," I can walk on water. And that's what God says. You can actually choose this. And here's the best part. Thank you. Have a seat. 
It doesn't matter how you feel. I'm assuming, I am reading into this, but I, but I can show you in the text, it says that they cried out and they were scared of the winds and waves. Peter had a lot of anxiety. He felt fear. You with me? But he obeyed Jesus. Even though he felt fear. And I don't think the fear went away because it does say he saw the winds and waves. And they, they got to him. So his fear overcame him and he, and he, and he, and he gave into it. But while he felt fear, he obeyed God. You with me so far? So it wasn't how you felt. It was what you chose to believe. When the Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind, it isn't that you don't feel fear. It's that you choose to believe God over how you feel. When, when, uh, when you, when you uh, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, it doesn't mean you don't get angry. It means you choose to do what God said above how you feel. Yeah. Right now in the public schools, they're telling kids, if you feel that way, that's what you are. You must be true to that. Don't let a religious people try to force you to be different. Really? Because sometimes I feel like killing people. Do I need to be true to that teacher? Because you're one of them. <laughs> Last time you sent me a test, I was like, I got a what? Uh, I need to be true to myself, teacher. No, you don't believe that. But that's what we're, they're taught. How you feel defines what you are. God says, no, what you choose to believe defines what you are. So here's the best part. You get to choose, no matter how you feel, to count it all joy when you fall into the trials that work patience because they stay. And they don't go away in the timing that you think they should. If you're a detailed planner in here, you hate me right now. Because you've given God a time limit. <laughs> like Peter. Lord, how much do I forgive someone seven times? Put a little number in there for, to help Jesus out so he doesn't get it too big. You follow me? And, and, and it says, I'm bearing under this thing. But I choose to believe what God said more than, than to, to let this overwhelm me. All right, God, I believe you. Do you feel that way? No, you feel horrible. It's called a trial. It's not called a trial unless it's horrible. Do you feel that way? No. But I choose to believe what God said. God, help me to see it like you see it. Yeah. And if you show me what you see, I won't be double-minded. I'm not going to look at Jesus in the wave. Yeah. I'm going to stick to believing what you said. Peter, Satan has sought thee to sift thee like wheat. He wanted you. He sought you to sift you like I have prayed for you. Here's what, it's horrible. He didn't say, I prayed for you that you won't go through the trials. He didn't say that. I prayed for you that when you go through the trial, your faith doesn't fail. That you believe God. Then he says this, when you're converted, it's going to change you. The word converted means changed. It doesn't mean saved like he, he, Peter was saved. When you're converted, when you're changed, strengthen your brethren. When you're changed, you're going to be able to help a whole bunch of people you couldn't help before. When he found Peter at the, at the, the, the riverside and when he said, Peter, do you love me? Yeah, feed my sheep. Go strengthen your brethren. Use this trial that you were under and you kept your faith. Use that to help other people. So here's the call tonight. Teenagers, you're in a trial? Stay faithful. Count it joy and say, God, I believe you're in charge. It's a fear of the Lord. I believe you're in charge, God. And I'll trust you. I'll carry this. And Lord, I, I, when this changes me, I'll use it for your glory. Married couples, when things are tough, well, they're not the husband, they're not the wife, they're not the, they do, they do. God, what? I'll trust you. Yes. I'll carry this. It doesn't mean it's okay. It doesn't mean you accept it. You know, it's, if your spouse is doing the wrong thing, it's not, you know, I'm not telling you to accept they're doing the wrong thing. I'm telling you to accept the trial if God has a trial in your life and let God use that trial to change you. God, I don't let this trial change me. You can change. I'm praying for my home. I'm praying things get better, but I'm, I'm going to stay under this trial. I'm going to carry this. God, please help me to under, see it like you see it. Wow, I get a reward. A reward I would have never have gotten. And for all of eternity, I'll be, my reward never ends. And I look at that moment and say, I'm so glad I got that job. I, I don't feel weary anymore, but I still have the paycheck. And stick with it. Keep under it. 
and ask God to help you to see it like he sees it. So you can go, oh, okay, now that I see what you did, God, ready? I'm not going to be double-minded. I'm not going to be in and out. I choose to believe what God said more than any other truth. I know it was long tonight, and you were such good listeners. I mean, that you did wonderful. But I think God has this for a reason. I think that sometimes you get in this trial, and all you see is the trial. Trials do this to you. And it consumes your life, and nothing exists but the trial. And when you say, God, give me wisdom, it's saying, let me see it from your point of view. Oh, yeah, okay, God. I want to trust you. I'll trust your truth more than any other truth. I'll have faith. So I'm going to ask you to have something tonight. Faith. I'm going to ask you to come to God and ask him to show you. The message doesn't show you. God will show you. You have to pray and ask God to show you. And when God shows you, don't be double-minded. You let God know, I'm going to stick with what you said. And when it gets tough, I'm sticking with you, God. When the waves get really heavy, I want to believe what you said more than any other truth that gets presented to me. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you said we can have joy in the middle of the trials. God, we're so thankful that then, not only did you say that, but you explained that this, 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 is, this trials are going to bring patience. And patience has a work to do. And we just need to let you do your work. We don't have to do anything but let you do the work. And then you went on to say, we can even ask you to help us to see it the right way. And Lord, we're asking you to give us wisdom to see the trials that are in our lives and help us to have have uh, to decide not to be double-minded but to decide we believe what you said more than any other truth please bless this invitation like only you can we ask in jesus precious name amen with his bowed eyes closed the piano plays will you make a decision you can come to an altar and pray or you can pray where you're at but will you tell god i'm going to have faith and i understand the apprehension because you don't know what god's going to carry you through but what you're telling God is that you trust Him with whatever He carries you into. Maybe tonight you've, you, you're suffering from trials that people around you just can't comprehend. Would you be willing to tell God that you'll trust Him with those trials? I'm not saying that Satan doesn't have any work or there isn't bad things that happen that Satan causes, but I am saying God can use it for good. Would you let God do a work in your life as you seek for God to fix the trial, would you let God do the work in your life and stay with it and trust God more than you trust any other truth? continues to play. I'm just going to be a little more time to pray. We're not in a hurry. When God's doing a work in your heart, you don't get in a hurry.